Welcome family, thank you so much for joining us online today. We hope that you are encouraged and empowered through this message. If you would like more information about us or to know who we are, visit our website or you can email us at info at southview.cc or if you would like to partner with us financially, you could do so at southview.cc slash giving. Now we hope you enjoy this message from Southview Church. <laughs> it's good to be in the house of the Lord, amen? Man, we had a good time at 845 and I'm believing that we're going to have, I'm going to say the same kind of time in 1045. I don't want to show favorites to either service, but 845 was pretty spectacular. But I believe in you and me. I believe. Some of you are catching where I'm going. Some of you are not. You're like, what is he talking about? I'm just riffing because you said Luther Vandross. And so now I'm thinking of love songs. Thanks, Pastor Eddie. <laughs> it is good. I just want to let you know our pastor Charles is in Kuala Lumpur. Is that right? Did I say it right? None of you care. You don't even know. It's over there. That's what all you know. It's over there. You got to take a plane. He's in Singapore. He's in Malaysia right now for this next few days. And we're so thankful that God is giving South you a global impact. Let me just say that again. You may think you're on 3011 Harrow Drive behind five other churches and used to be a Kroger, but you are actually making a difference across the globe. I want to even give a shout out to my friends, the Guidos, who are here again, second service here. They're getting ready to leave because they have so many great things to do, but I want to let them know next week, let you know next week, we're going to be giving to this amazing couple. They have an amazing ministry ministering to those people that are in the arts and entertainment and music industry. People that you never would think need ministry, need it. In fact, I believe sometimes people in ministry need ministry more sometimes. Amen? Amen. And so they are the people that go without a, like they don't demand a cent. They, I mean, Michael could tell you stories just showing up at airports, being led by the Spirit to minister to people. Artists, he's been on tour with many artists, just sitting on their bus, just being a pastor, no charge to them, just loving people. And I'm so grateful and thankful for people like this, for a couple like this that love people in the arts and entertainment industry unconditionally. So today we bless them. Next week, I just pray, Lord, that we would be able to pour into their ministry financially and bless them. But today we bless them with strength. We bless them with joy. We bless them with provision. We bless them with good health. I speak, Lord, divine opportunities, divine favor, Lord, that you will show them places and people to minister to. I thank you, Lord, for people like them that have a heart for the entertainment and arts industry. I thank you, Lord, that we can affect them greatly. And, Lord, as I declared in the first service, I'll say it again. Lord, open up doors in the secular realm like never before. Artists, musicians, actors and actresses, producers and directors, God. I pray, Lord, that they would have influence to the influencers. And, Lord, that they would speak life and hope and joy and the Holy Spirit lead and guide them into all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, my friends. I want to remind you, two weeks ago, we baptized 20 people at Southview. Come on now. 20 people. Man, never gets old. Also, parent of W5P2, it's time to get up and get your kid. Amen. 20 people. Isn't that amazing? Think about this for a minute. We have done, we're seeing the harvest, the great harvest. I believe there's even greater harvest to come. I'm thankful. Every time we do this, it gets better and better. I want to also remind you, happy resurrection Sunday. Did you know he resurrected and he's still alive? Like I know we we celebrated last week, but did you know he's the same God? He's still not in that tomb. He's still alive. Come on, church. Come on, church. It's good to be alive in this season, in this time. Today, I want to continue our legacy series. This is part seven. You made it. Tell somebody you made it. And we're not done. Tell them we ain't done yet. Come on, talk to your people here. We, we, we're going to have one more message tomorrow. Next Sunday, I'm going to wrap it up, and then we're going to start a whole new series. But I want to let you know that today, and as the weeks that we have been going through this, my desire and my hope is that we will unlock this word legacy, not only for this house, but for you. That you'll discover what the word legacy means for you. I know the Lord gives us words, but sometimes it takes a while to unlock them. So today, we do that. As I transition, one of the greatest transitions I could ever think about was, how many people remember Jerry Springer? Raise your hands if you know <laughs> Jerry Springer. <laughs> Raise your hands. Let me see. Okay. All right. So you know the phenomenon that happened when Jerry Springer started a show. 
remember watching Jerry Springer and thinking, there's no way in the world there's people like this. <laughs> I got the privilege of meeting a producer that worked on the show early on in the whole thing. And believe it or not, it was 100% completely real. They found people that had stories that literally had never been on an airplane before. You can imagine. Now you're remembering the people that you saw on that show. Yeah, that fits about right. And these people came to get a reveal. It wasn't a baby reveal. Well, sometimes it was a baby reveal, but the baby was someone else's. There was these constant <laughs> levels of dysfunction that you watched. Now, the reason why you watched it, you don't know this, but the reason why you watched it is because it's part of you said, at least I'm not that crazy. <laughs> come on, some of you, right? Some of you are like, wait, my, I do come from a family like that. Some of you, it hit a little too close to home. I remember watching this, and I remember what it spawned, this sequential list of TV shows known as reality TV. Now, we know reality TV isn't reality, but the one thing that we could say in the early on game of this whole reality show was there are some really crazy people out there. Now, may I say this to you, that some of you may be those crazy people. Might I say to you that all of us in our state before Christ were those people. And so I want to talk to you today about this word identity. I want to talk to you about the identity in legacy. This word is something that God has been unpacking in my life for many years and I believe will continue. It'll be a message, a life message for me. The word identity. What does it really mean to be who we are? People are always wondering this question that it permeates throughout society. It's this word, who am I? Who am I? Not what is my name, but who am I? Who am I really? And when we watch crazy shows like Jerry Springer, we're reminded that people are crazy and we need Jesus. Amen. Apart from Christ, we can do nothing. Apart from Christ, you're pretty crazy. And the fact of the matter is, is he steps into our lives when we need him the most. But he never leaves because we need him all the time. So today, if you have your Bibles, I want to touch on these scriptures here today. I want to parallel the message of Jesus in Luke and the message of Paul in 2 Corinthians. Jesus in Luke 6 is speaking a message that some of us believe he spoke pretty much all over the place. Jesus did not have podcasts. You couldn't watch him on YouTube. So he had to do the old school method, which was to preach the same message in every town. But this was a powerful message that never got old. I can imagine the disciples listening to it saying, we still haven't figured this out. Because it's so deep. Jesus came to flip the kingdom upside down. Look at this. And before we get into Luke 6, if we go back further, or I should say chapter verse 43, if we go back, he's talking about the Beatitudes in verse 20. Then he talks about loving your enemies. Then he talks about judging others and how you're accountable for how you judge other people. He preached tough messages. How many know I'm thankful, or you should be thankful for the tough messages? Because it's the tough messages that change us. So Jesus speaks in verse 43 about a tree and its fruit. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known, say known, is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a gramble bush. The good person out of the good treasures of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasures produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. How many know you can learn a lot from what people say? Just listen to the words that are coming from my mouth. So let's parallel that with what Paul says to the church of Corinth. Paul is speaking, writing a letter to this church. And in chapter 5, verse 17, he says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to him and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Did you know that you are in ministry? You didn't know that. You are a minister of reconciliation. 
that is in Christ, God was reconciled the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for God. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made himself to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I looked up the word reconciliation, and the Greek word is a word, alessio. I may be pronouncing that wrong, but probably most of you don't care. The word, the root word of that actually means change. So reality is reconciliation. The ministry of reconciliation is really you are a minister of change. Just think about that for a minute. You are an agent of change. When you step into places, places change. Do you ever wonder what happens in the spirit realm? Maybe this is just me. When you walk into a room, now it depends on how you're flowing with the Holy Spirit, where your life is. But I believe that every Christian, when they walk into a room, should change the atmosphere. I, I just don't understand what it was like to see Jesus in flesh form walk into a room. I can't even imagine the atmosphere, the particles and neutrons and electrons in the room changing because the Creator, who created everything in the room, walked into the room and was an agent of change. Can you just imagine for a minute? Like imagine people are gossiping, having a, you know, just talking nasty stuff, and Jesus walks in, and there's a hush. <sighs> Can you imagine people are having a pity party in a room, complaining about things? Jesus walks in, and everything's quiet because he's an agent of change. Now you are called to a ministry of change. So young people, when you walk into your school, when you walk down the hallway, you can change your hallways. You can change your grades. Just kidding. I was just kidding. Do, study. Do work. Study. That's how you change your grades. But you can change things. So to me, when I realize that we're all called to ministry, it holds me to a different level. So now I don't go food shopping the same. Bear with me. I don't know where this is coming from, but somebody needs to hear this. Your life changes when you know Christ. All of a sudden, everything you do has a purpose. That's why you go to the Kroger down the street, but you still run into the person that you tried to avoid, and they come up to you and began to spill their guts to you, and you don't know why because you just came to get some milk, and now 30, 40 minutes later, your wife is texting you, where are you? And you're realizing God called you to a message and a message of reconciliation. And so when you walk in, things change. I, you know, it's so funny we're living in the city of Spring Hill. It's such a small town with struggles. Can we all just agree on that? Columbia is a big town with struggles. They all have struggles. Nobody can understand the growth. And the thing is, is we want this little tiny hometown feel, but we also want bigger roads and, and Chick-fil-A's. <laughs> we don't know what we want. We're just confused. But one thing I do know is when you walk into places in this city, there's divine encounters. I don't think I've ever gone anywhere without running into somebody realizing that God had put them in my path because I'm an agent of change. So if I parallel these two messages, the one that Jesus spoke and the one that Paul spoke, I want to put it all together in this legacy series to say this, to recap this. The seed bears fruit. We know that God is the great seeder. He's the great Har far farmer. He's the one who scatters the seed. And the seed falls on soil that we are called to cultivate for the harvest. So the soil is your heart. How do I hold the seed? How do I receive the word? Your fruit then is indicative of the condition of your heart or your soil. So what you bear fruit is indicative of what's in your heart. Paul says your fruit needs to change from how it used to be before Christ. There should be a change in your life. Everyone has a story. Everyone has an opportunity for hurt. Every one of you in this place has a story. And every one of you has been hurt somewhere by someone. That's just the reality. we got to get that out of the way. It's just going to happen. I hate to say it, but it's happening. It's going to happen. It may happen later today. The reality is, is God has called us to walk above the hurt. God has called us to walk above the dysfunction. And I want to say this to you today. You will create your legacy by how you respond to adversity. 
Because what I see with people is they use their adversity either as an advantage to propel them to better things or they use it as a crutch to hold them back. There's two ways you can go. And I believe this, that every one of you in this place is at a fork in the road at some point in your life, multiple times, where you have been hurt and you have come against an adversary and you now have a choice. Am I going to go forward or am I going to make my camp and live here in this hurt? You will create your legacy by how you respond to your adversity. Some examples is unforgiveness reaps bitterness. Doubt reaps fear. Broken promises reap mistrust. Fatherlessness reaps performance for approval and love. And sin reaps death. I remember my first encounters with this thing called deliverance ministry. Sozo, Inner Healing, Freedom Center, whatever you want to call it. I remember sitting in there and walking with someone and leading someone to a place of freedom. I remember sitting here and listening to the person talk about why they were there. I'm here because I have an issue with my back. I'm here because my kids are acting a fool. I'm here whatever it is. And I watched as Holy Spirit, as only he could, began to reveal things that they didn't even know was in them. All of a sudden, they're confessing things that they happened in their life. They didn't even realize that happened years ago. Holy Spirit brings it in a pl safe place, brings it to the root, to the surface, so that it can be dealt with. And I walked out of there amazed at how God is so into the very nuances of our life that I walked away from inner healing thinking, this is what the church was designed to do. You know, it's not our job to save people. Let me just take away that because many times as me as growing up, I thought I had to go rescue everybody. God already did that. It's already been done. He said, go and make disciples. And so the best disciples are the ones that are free. So God is calling us to walk with people hand in hand through their junk so that they can be made whole. I realize that when I come to church and I see people, and even myself have fit in that category, and we're complaining about old stuff, that's an old nature that Paul was talking about. Behold, you become a new nature. When you receive Jesus, something should change. Okay. Your identity is revealed and your legacy through the purpose of Christ. Holy Spirit is working in you. Today I believe this, that in this place right now, that God is calling us to rise up to a whole nother level. In fact, I, 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 did, I did a wedding. Actually, I was able to bless Ginny and Logan. They were in our first service today, and they asked me to, to bless their wedding. So they had a, a, a pastor who's been in their life for many years come and do the wedding, and I got to come up and bless them, which I love. And so I came up, and I said, you know what? Because you profess Christ, because you've been grafted in, I now can pronounce the blessings over Abraham to you. Because you're now brought into the legacy of Abraham. So I got to bless them. And the reality is, is the legacy of Abraham is waiting on you to walk in it and receive it. It's not that it's just sitting there. You have to grab a hold of it. You have to understand that it's part of your identity. I use this analogy all the time with my kids. When my kids come into the house, they realize this is the house of Rampula. This is where they live. So if they ask me, could I go to the bathroom, it would get old very quickly. This is your house. You live here. Do what you need to do. For many of us as Christians, we've been bought by a price. We've confessed our heart to be a Christian. We know we're sons and daughters, yet we don't partake in the things that Jesus died for. We're living in the house, still asking God if I can go to the bathroom. Can I do this? God's like, you are a son and daughter. Freely I give. Freedom is for you. You are free. Look, I'm, we're going to talk about this. We live in a culture where we blame others for our behavior. This is such a cultural thing. It's a word called entitlement. Well, if you didn't treat me like this, I wouldn't be like this. If you were a better husband, if you were a better wife, if you were better parents, we wouldn't be crazy. If all those things we put on others, why? Because we don't want to be responsible for our fruit. 
I've never seen an apple tree complain about its fruit. Talking to a lemon tree. Like if you were only orangey more, we would be better suited with each other. It's interesting how we as Christians tend to shift blame to other people when really we need to be accountable for what we're bearing. Your identity in a legacy. Church has become a revolving door for many of us because we go from church to church blaming the church for our issues. This is exactly how I felt it would happen after I said that. Because the reality is many of us, we have gone from church to church to church trying to figure out the perfect church, and God has been telling us it's not the church, it's you. Isn't it interesting how you can go from church to church and still find the same person that you complain about at each church? Different name, different face, but they're still the same issues. Isn't it interesting that the pastor says the same thing, hurts you the same way? All the issues, they still happen at every church. Why is that? Maybe because God in his sovereignty is trying to change your fruit. That's why I love the church. Because the word of God says iron sharpens iron. We, 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 we like to use scripture but we don't really like to receive it, right? Iron sharpens iron when I'm sharpening you, right? If I'm rubbing, brother, I'm sharpening you, brother. But what happens when somebody sharpens us? What happens when we go to church and a message was designed and intricately woven right to every issue that we have, and you're like, how did he know I was going through that? Only because the Holy Spirit put you there to receive a freedom word for your life. I love how God does that. Paul is a perfect example of reconciliation. That's why God gave him this message. Because he, of anybody, knew what it meant to be reconciled. His name was Saul. He was on God's mission to kill Christians. That was his, his goal. He really believed he was doing God's work. In fact, he would go into town and Christians would hide. They knew about him. He was the ultimate threat to Christianity. People hated him. He hated Christians. And look what Jesus does. Meets him on a road called Damascus. I love how Jesus picks the craziest people to use. I love how he loves to pick people that irk us the most to minister to us. Anybody say amen. I love how he always finds that person that always seems to say the thing that rubs me the wrong way to finally become my best friend. Anybody ever have that happen to you? Paul, Saul, was that person to the church. Now, here's the interesting thing about it is he understood reconciliation the greatest because he was used to it in his own life. Your legacy is revealed once your heart is healed. What happened was Jesus met Saul on the road to Damascus and identified his issue. He said, look, why are you persecuting me? He said, well, I'm doing your work. No, 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 you're... You're not. And God then begins to remove everything from Saul's life to now focus him on the purpose and plan that he was designed for. I love this because in Acts 9 verse 15, God ministers to a man named Ananias. And he says to him, listen, I want you to go and speak to Paul. And he said, listen, that's the wrong dude that you want me to go to. That dude's beheading people like me. And listen to what God says to him. I love how God speaks this. Somebody needs to hear this because he says, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. God used everything of Saul to further the kingdom through Paul. He changed his name and changed the game. It's going to keep rhyming because God wants you to hear it, that God can use you even though you think you're unusable. I love this. This is a mind-blowing moment. Listen, I want to read this to you. This is out of a, a leadership book that we're going through as a staff. And I love this, this sentence. It says here, it's talking about Saul, talking about Paul. He is a present-day a present day parallel to this amazing man would be someone who could speak Chinese in Beijing quoting Confucius and Mencius, writing cogent theology and teach it at Oxford and defend his cause using flawless Russian before the Soviet Academy of Sciences. What I'm saying is, is 
Paul was taught. He was educated. He had the ability to speak to people that none of us could ever get in front of. He was so educated and so distinguished. He had every degree on the wall, yet he missed the very purpose of his identity. So God then said, listen, you're probably one of the most screwed up people on the planet right now. You're stopping everything that I'm passionate about. So let me just take you and use you even though you're so far from me. He meets Saul on the road to Damascus, changes his name, changes his heart, And Paul becomes one of the greatest writers of the New Testament, writes some of the greatest, most profound statements that we as a church build our church upon. And this was somebody that was designed to kill you and me. Now, if that doesn't fire you up to let you know that God can use crazy people, then I don't know what else can. See, Paul knew message of reconciliation because Paul was an example of change. He was an extreme example of change. And when I think about this, I realize this, that he couldn't live where he was. God had to come and encounter him and change him so much that he even changed his name. I believe in this place right now that some of you, God wants to, now hear me out here, I'm not going to say he's going to change your name, but he's going to change your identity. Because I believe right now in this place that even though you know Jesus, you're still operating in the old nature. Because here's the deal. This scripture, Paul was writing to the church. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. He's reminding the church that just because you receive Jesus doesn't mean that the old nature changes automatically. And how do I know that? Because I know a lot of crazy Christians. Because I know a lot of Christians that are sick. Because I know a lot of Christians living in fear. Because I know a lot of Christians that still use old language. But there's hope. Turn to somebody and say, there's hope. But there's hope. There's hope for you and me. Look at this. I realize that God placed the church to be an agent of change because many times we're the last people to know the kind of fruit that we're producing. If if I could take you and bring you to behind the scenes of what people say about you, it'd be interesting to know what they say about you behind closed doors. We are sometimes the last people to discover what we really, the fruit that we're bearing. And here's the deal. You want to know the kind of fruit? Ask Holy Spirit. You want to know the kind of fruit? Listen to the way you talk. You want to know the kind of fruit? Look at the production in your life. This is a word for you today because I want you to know this, that God wants to change your identity. And here's the deal. Some of you today, you are on the road to Damascus in your life. You know Jesus. You love Jesus. You tithe. You even lift your hands halfway in worship. You're really doing it. You're trying your best. You serve in children's ministry. You put on a smile. You're doing it. But God still has to meet you on a road. Why? Because he's not changed your heart. It's easy to come forward because when somebody says, does anybody want to go to heaven? Yeah, I want to go to heaven. Does anybody feel like you're a mess up and you need a savior? Yes, I'm coming up forward. But how many know that sometimes the speech takes a while to change? Sometimes our nature has to change. The first step in all of this is to know that there's something in you that still needs to change. Now, the reason why this word is not a good word or fun word for people is because we want to be finished work. Like, we want to really be done. Like, I'm done, man. I'm good. Nobody wants to school, go to school for the rest of your life. You know what I mean? Like, we want to graduate, and I want to move on, you know? But sometimes the person that's hindering us from graduating is us. Sometimes we're the ones standing in the gap of ourselves. We're the ones that are hindering the production of ourselves. So we want to come to church and blame sister so-and-so and and brother so-and-so and and church pastor this and guy and the worship leader for not doing this because it's easier to shift the blame on someone else. But the reality is you can be in a cave and be free. You shouldn't need a worship song to bring you to worship if you have to sit in I'm a, look, can, I, can I can I just be real with you if God is moving and you're sitting in your seat with no response something's wrong I'm not telling you you got to worship like me or worship like Catherine or worship like Eddie or but I'm just saying when God moves there should be a change and I can tell free people by the way they act 
I can tell free people by the way, the fruit. You could see fruit. I don't know if you know that. See, some people think they can walk around and fake it. Like, they can, they can completely make sure. This is George Jefferson. Remember George Jefferson? Remember how he had that thing? Like, you can fake this. You can fake this, man. I, I got this, man. I got this. I got this. But you know what? You can tell fruit. You know why? Because rotten fruit stinks. And I'm telling you today, church, it's time. Man. You know why? Because we're called to change the world. I love, I love Son of God, the movie. I, I, I remember when in the one part when Jesus is in the boat with Peter. Some of you know what I'm talking about. And he says this amazing line. I was like, I don't know if he said it, but I wish he did. He's like, Peter, we're going to change the world. Like, I was like, epic. Mic drop in the boat. Like, I'm like, Jesus. Twitter. I mean, come on now. Like, like, but the reality is, is do you believe you can change the world if you can't even get out of bed? Do you believe you could change the world when you can't even change, you can't even change your frown upside down? Like, you, you, you can't even have joy of the Lord in your strength. These are things that are fruit of the Spirit, yet you can't even tap. When's the last time you laughed? When's the last time you had peace? When's the last time you loved? When's the last time you had self-control? Oh, well, that's, I'm working towards it. Well, listen, let me tell you something. The fruit of the Lord is evident in those who are walking in it, who abide in Him. It says that I abide in the, come on, He is the, He is the vine, and we are the branch. That means you don't have to work up. You just tap in. Like, I don't have to work up joy. I, when, when I don't, listen, can I just be honest with you? Sometimes I don't have joy. I know you're thinking, like, no way. Yeah, seriously. Sometimes it's rough. So I got to tap in because he's the vine. So he gives me nutrients, and I'm the branches. All of a sudden, I, I produce joy. Why? Because I just tapped into his joy. Church, come on. I'm going to preach you happy today. You know why? Because I believe in your fruit. I believe it so much, I had this tattooed on my arm. Freedom in Christ. John 8, 36. For who the Son sets free is free on Sundays at 1045. Yeah. Who the Son sets free is free on Sunday mornings when we're in the presence of God. No, no. It's free indeed. That means there's never a moment that you should walk in bondage. Now, I'm telling you, this is a tough message, and I'm preaching to myself, so give me grace because I'm walking this out in this real time. But the reality is there's never a moment that we should be in bondage. And when you go back in bondage, what you do is essentially tell Jesus on the cross that wasn't good enough. When you claim sickness, what you essentially do is picture Jesus getting whipped and telling him it's not going to work. Because cancer is stronger than your, your, your beating. Real talk? You're like, thanks a lot for making me come to this church today. If you're a guest, we love you. But listen, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so down with this, this talk in churches. I guess I'll always be struggling with this. No, as soon as you said that, you know what you did? You went back into the old nature. And, and, and this, is, this is how Paul saw Paul. He, he, he flipped it because he realized everything about my old nature, I don't want to ever talk about. It's like Paul wanted that, that just to go away. You know what I'm saying? Like a criminal record that you never knew was really there. I'm just going to get that to go away. Hey, Scott, could you get my criminal record to go away? Because Paul was so embarrassed that the very thing he did was so far from God's heart, yet he tapped into this idea of reconciliation that he can ride above it and actually use his past to minister to people that the disciples never had an audience with. How about that? God picked Saul because he said, guess what? My disciples will never be able to minister to those people, so I'm going to find the most educated, craziest dude on the planet. I'm going to encounter him, change his identity, and then I'm going to send him back. And if you read the scriptures that Saul wrote when he turned into Paul, Everything he wrote was profound. He knew how to rile up the church. I like people that rile up churches. I will always struggle with whatever it is. Can you stop saying that? Can you stop putting definites on the evil? Can you stop putting definites on dysfunction? Can we stop saying I will always, I guess I'm going to catch the flu. I guess I'm going to get this. Cancer runs in my family. Stop saying that. Stop being a service agent for the devil. He just sits back and high fives you. It's like, come on, thanks for being my, my partner in crime. Everything about the way we speak should be 
communicating a new nature. Come on. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Well, you say, but, but I'm just being a realist. Listen, you don't need to remind people of your dysfunction. <laughs> Can you imagine Saul going around talking about, all, you know, I killed so-and-so. Oh, that was your brother. <laughs> Sorry about that. You know, like he, he didn't want to go back there. I talk about this. Talk about the grace and mercy and the newness every morning, what he did for me. An agent of change. That's what you are. You're an agent of change. I like that. You're a minister of the gospel. Listen, stop saying, stop, stop, stop justifying your anger by saying you're passionate. I remember thinking, you know, like, I'm Italian, man. I'm just passionate. I'm angry, you know. No, 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 I'm Irish. I got an Irish temper. No, no, no. Listen, anger's wrong. It's not a fruit of the spirit. Last I looked. And if we continue to justify anger by saying we're passionate, or how about fear by saying we're cautious? You've got to lock more doors at night to go to bed than pray prayers to God to take care of them, then you may have an issue with fear. Ooh. Did I hear something? I really believe this. I believe that we love to partner with dysfunction by giving it a different name. Now, I'm just being cautious. I just want to make sure it's God's will. No, no, no. You, you're, you're hesitating on activating the plan that God spoke to you five times through 15 different prophets. He's given you a sign. He wrote it in the sky, and you're being cautious. No, you're being disobedient. See, the reality is you have an opportunity to step into your identity, and your identity could very well change the world. So I have an obligation to you as your pastor to activate the things inside of you so that you can change the world. Because if I don't give you the messages that I'm struggling with, if I don't preach the full gospel and all gospel and nothing but the gospel, if I don't spur you on to great things, then I have an obligation at the end of all this that I didn't give my all. But I believe in every one of you in this place today. I believe in 1045. Not only did you come at the right time, but you came at the right time. Because guess what? God wants you to know that he has plans for you. A God can know you before you were born. If he could design you before you were created in your mother's womb, how much more so are you intentionally here for a reason that you need to understand? So I'm telling you right now, your legacy is not just being a mom. That's part of it, but you're also a world changer. And so when I look at my kids and they act a fool and I got to change 15 different diapers and they're smelly and all that stuff, you know what I remember? This is a world changer I'm getting to be part of. I'm not just changing diapers, but I'm changing lives. Come on, mic drop. I'm telling you right now, for some of you, you're looking at your life and you're looking at all the bad things. And God says, I made you a new creation. The old has passed away. Do you know what it means to pass away? It means to die. It means to bury. It means to never be there again. So your old nature needs to pass away. Stop talking about what you did. Stop talking about what, where you're from. Stop talking about all the things you regret. Stop. Stop. The old nature. Mm. Remember, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. This week, I want to encourage you today to listen to what you say. Now, you know what I love about Holy Spirit? I want you to listen to me because I know there's a lot going on, but, but understand this. The thing about the Holy Spirit is he's so good at speaking to us in the words and language that we need to hear. So the way he speaks to Ben is not the way he speaks to me. The way he speaks to Jane is not the way he speaks to me. The way he speaks to Sandy in China, he speaks to us in our own language. And he knows how to communicate to our heart. So it's not like he's going to come in the way he comes to me, to Jane. But he'll speak to Jane the way that she receives it. And he'll speak to Sandy the way that she receives it. And the beautiful thing about the Holy Spirit is he not only is a gentleman, but he knows how to get right to the point. You ever get in a meeting with somebody and you spend 90% of the meeting talking about nothing to get to 10% of the crust of why we're here. You know, the reason why I called you here, that was two hours ago. Okay. I like to just get to the point. Holy Spirit, why did I respond to my wife like that? Holy Spirit, because here's the deal for those of you that are married, it's not your job to fix them. It's God to fix you. And guess what? All of a sudden, when God changes my heart, all of a sudden I love her differently. So, can, can I just dispel this myth, church? When I say we're going to change the world, what I mean by it is God's going to change you. 
so he can change the world. So you don't need to bust down into clubs and start telling them what they need to do. Y'all sitting up in here. Come on now. Let's go. Let's go outside. We're going to repent. We're like, see you later, man. You need to bust into people's relationships and tell them not to have sex outside of marriage. And Listen, all you need to do is be who God's called you to be. And guess what? When we walk in righteousness and holiness, because the Word of God says we can be righteous and holy as He is holy. Can I just tell you this? That righteousness and holiness is attractive to dark to people in dark places. Can I just tell you that? People in dark places are looking for light. They're looking, they're like, they're like, they're like, they're like, oh my God, they're, they're like flies. You know what I'm talking about? In the summertime, it's getting ready to happen. You know what I mean? They're gonna start ah, because they see hope in you. But you know what? If you still look like them and you still smell like them and you're still walking in darkness, how are they gonna know Christ? If you're still speaking like them, you need to elevate to a new creation. Come on now. This is a good message. I feel myself preaching to myself. I, you do realize when I say this is a good message, I'm not promoting myself. I'm just telling you, Holy Spirit, speaking through me. Just to set the tone. Because some people are like, that's pretty arrogant. I'm just telling you. I know when he's speaking through me. And I know he's got this message today. Church, be free. Church, be free. Church, be free free don't let the legacy you pass down be things nobody wants man I want my kids to say dad man he lived he loved God he lived with his heart man he loved God so much and then he loved us <laughs> I want my fruit I want my fruit like I want people to see the fruit I know not everybody's called to Southview, and not everybody might not like the way I preach and all that. That's fine. We gotta get past all of that. We gotta get past ourselves. We are called to do something. And Paul had to realize that he had to work hard in the beginning to prove to people that he really was legit. But the reality was eventually people got it because this dude didn't only talk about it, but he lived it. And eventually he got persecuted for the very thing that he persecuted others for. That's a changed creation. That's a changed heart. So when we sing, ain't no valley high enough and mountain high enough and all those things, Aretha Franklin and all that stuff, why do I always forget the bridge? Tell me the first one. There ain't no shadow. Yeah, that stuff. Ain't no shadow high enough. What is it? Ain't no shadow. Light up. You, you, listen. Can, can, can I just tell you, you I, I don't know how you could sit in your seat and sing that. I don't know how you could sit in your seat and sing that with, with it just, no, because to me, he did that for me. So everything within me has to be changed by his glory. No longer am I the old creation. Listen, I'm not the old Mark. And people go to me, well, man, you've changed over the seven years. I hope so. I hope I'm seven months later I'm changed. I'm on a journey. You're on a journey. We're on a journey to look more like Christ. And I'm not staying the way I used to be. I'm not staying the way I used to be. Come on. Come on. Let's sing this like we're believing. Come on. There's no shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't climb up. Coming after. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No shadow.
today, I, I just, if you would just close your eyes for this moment. I, I remember just a few weeks ago preaching a message on honor and forgiveness. And I, I'm so nervous about the message just because I, I felt like it was a strong word. Boy, I didn't realize this one would be stronger. But anyway, I had so many people come to me and tell me, man, I, I, I thank you. Like, I need, I need to forgive so-and-so. People wrote letters to, to, to people and, 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 and met with people. And, and I remember hearing people tell me that they would be in the service and Holy Spirit brought to their mind people they needed to forgive. So today, I'm going to ask Holy Spirit right now, if you would just close your eyes, remove distractions. Because I want to let you know this, that there is freedom. I really believe in John 8, 36. I believe it. It's a life it's a life scripture for me. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. I believe it. I believe for you today, Holy Spirit is going to identify places in your life that need to change. Here's the greatest hope of all. He can change it all easily, easily. If you struggle with anger, I believe some people in this place today, you struggle with anger. You don't understand why everything is, lights you off. It's a short fuse. You, you say, well, my dad was like that. My grandfather was, I break the curse. I break the generational. No more excuses. No more excuses. For some of you, you feel like you get sick all the time. Your kids are always sick. I don't know what it is. I break the curse of infirmity off of you. See, I'm telling you, it's bigger than just you. You think, well, I don't know. Maybe I just got a bad at least on life. I got bad enzymes and chromosomes and all that stuff. Listen, he came that you might have life and life more abundantly. Either we believe the word or we don't. I speak life over you and a change of nature today. And let me leave you with this because I believe some of you, your change is difficult to do alone. That's why I love Mary B and her team who spend hours and hours, countless hours a week ministering to people in secret places, private, healthy places, just to share freedom to them in the Freedom Center. I want you to know this. Some of you, I believe this in my spirit. This is for this service right now. Some of you, you've been running from church because church has all the tools to bring freedom to your situation. I believe right now that people are, are being placed in your life to help you walk through freedom. I speak that over you right now, that you will have wisdom to see the person and the persons that are going to help you walk through freedom. I want to let you know right now that our Freedom Center is definitely undermanned. We have people coming from other churches that come to our Freedom Center. People that don't go to church because they're desperate for healing. People come in for physical issues, they lead with a changed heart. We're seeing people getting healed of cancer. I'm telling you, this is real stuff happening here. You need to know this because I want you to know that we need more freed people to free others. We desperately need more troops. We desperately need more help. And for some of you, you've been sitting back worrying and complaining about things and God says it's time to get in the game. So I'm calling you out today in a good way. I'm saying we need you. We need you. Prayer ministry team, if you would come forward here today. If you don't know Jesus today, then I want you to come forward. I want to pray with you. I want our team to pray with you and lead you into a walk with Jesus Christ. It's the greatest decision you'll ever make. And I'm telling you right now, some of you, this message has hit you, and I want you to know you can come forward here today. If you need physical healing, I want to pray with you. We want to pray with you. We want to stand with you today. There are some things you can't do alone. You know what I love about apple trees? And I'm not a big farmer, so bear with me. But I will say this. Many times they're planted in rows. They're planted next to other trees. Did you know that many times, many fruit trees actually need other fruit trees to cross-pollinate? Did you know that most fruit trees need bees to pollinate so that they can bear fruit? Did you know that? What I'm saying to you is, is maybe the very place God placed you is the very place to help fix you. Don't run. Don't run. I'm going to bless you today. I'm telling you right now, God is awakening identity in this place. I am telling you, you're going to change the world. Believe it. Believe it. So today, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he make his countenance, lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. May the strength of God go with you. May the wisdom of God instruct you.
May the hand of God protect you. May the word of God direct you. And may the identity of God come alive in you. And may you be sealed in Christ this day and forevermore. God, we ask. We say, Lord, make our hearts like yours. Hey, thank you so much for joining us online today. If you do not know Jesus personally as Savior, as Lord, and that He loves you, we want to know about it. We would love the opportunity to pray with you and encourage you on your journey to knowing Him more. Also, if you're looking for ways to connect into the family or if this message has impacted you, we want to hear about it. Visit our website or send us an email. Thank you so much for watching.